Yes, well, that's yes. leading us to the question I was going to put. And I've worked with some very good ones. John mm -hmm. Houston is very, very good. I worked with Carol Reed. He's very, very fine. And the purchase in the beer habit plays the number. Oh, my. To goad him to such a fury of drink and rage that he'd kick open the locked door of your bedroom and damn near kill you. Lancaster's journey from circus acrobat to one of Hollywood's most legendary leading men is as captivating as the characters he played on screen. Join us as we look back on Lancaster's extraordinary career, from his breakout appearances in films like From Here to Eternity, to memorable performances in classics like The Birdman of Alcatraz and Atlantic City. Along the way, we'll learn about the rumors and controversies surrounding Lancaster, which range from rumored feuds with co-stars to speculation about his personal life. Let's dive in. The Early Years Lancaster was born on November 2, 1913, in New York City. His parents, Elizabeth and James, were not wealthy. His father delivered mail. They were Protestants, and all four grandparents immigrated from Ulster, Ireland to the United States. His mother's family was from Belfast, and had ties to English settlers who arrived in Ireland during the plantation of Ulster. Lancaster grew up in East Harlem, New York City. He discovered his affinity for gymnastics while attending DeWitt Clinton High School. Sports also piqued his interest, and he became a basketball star. But things took a terrible turn when his mother died of a brain hemorrhage before he finished high school. Despite the loss, Lancaster saw chances ahead. He was accepted to New York University based on his athletic ability and a scholarship. However, he did not stay to finish his studies. Lancaster's early years were characterized by low beginnings, a passion for athletics, and personal sorrow. No one could even think that he would rise from a working-class home in New York City to the world stage that would make him one of Hollywood's most recognizable actors. The beginning of the circus's career and his World War II service. Burt Lancaster met his lifelong friend Nick Cravat when he was just a child. They were like two peas in a pod, always together. They both learned how to act and do circus stunts at Union Settlement, a historic location in their hometown. They put in a lot of practice and improved dramatically. In the 1930s, they decided to officially form a pair. They named themselves Lang and Cravat. People enjoyed watching them perform their acrobatic acts. They performed so well that they were invited to join the K Brothers Circus. It was their dream come true. However, life can be tough at times. Lancaster suffered a serious accident in 1939. He suffered severe injuries and was unable to do his circus tricks. He was heartbroken since he loved to perform, so he had to leave the circus and find something else to do. He tried several jobs to make ends meet. First, he worked as a salesperson at Marshall Fields, selling items to customers. Then, he became a singing waiter in a variety of eateries. It was a significant contrast from hanging on bars and performing flips in the circus. But then, something significant happened. World War II broke out. Lancaster refused to sit back. The World War II. Lancaster wanted to do his part in the war efforts too. In January 1943, he joined the United States Army. He was assigned to the 21 Special Service Division. His job was to entertain the soldiers and keep their spirits up. Lancaster was pleased to be a part of it. However, he did not remain in one location. He traveled all the way to Italy with General Mark Clark's 5th Army. It was difficult being away from home and in a conflict zone, but Lancaster knew it was a necessary job. Finally, in October 1945, the war was over, and Lancaster was released from the army. Nonetheless, he continued to work in the entertainment industry. He still adored it too much. He persevered, eventually earning the technician level in the fifth grade. So, even though Lancaster had to leave the circus for the war, his passion for entertaining never waned. He transitioned from flying through the air in the circus to raising troops' spirits during the war. That's quite the journey for one man. Harry Brown's Broadway Play after ending his army service, Lancaster returned to New York City. Even though he wasn't interested in performing at first, fate had different ideas for him. One day, while visiting his fiance at work, a producer noticed him in an elevator and sensed promise. Lancaster was encouraged by this experience and decided to try his hand at acting. He auditioned for Harry Brown's Broadway play, A Sound of Hunting, and was surprised when he was cast. Despite the play's brief run of three weeks, Lancaster's performance piqued the interest of Hollywood agent Harold Hecht. Hecht sensed something exceptional in Lancaster and offered him a big promise. He could create his own films in Hollywood within five years. Lancaster, eager to embrace this opportunity, left New York and traveled to Los Angeles. There, he met producer Hal B. Wallace, who recognized immense potential in him. 
Wallace offered Lancaster a contract to feature in eight films, which marked the start of Lancaster's rise to Hollywood fame. The Big Break in Hollywood Burt Lancaster's big break in Hollywood came in 1947, when he featured in Desert Fury, his first film for producer Hal Wallace. Even though he wasn't the biggest actor on the list, the film marked the start of Lancaster's rise to fame. Lewis Allen's picture, Desert Fury, lays the groundwork for Lancaster's future success in the film industry. But before Desert Fury hit theaters, Lancaster was given another great opportunity. Mark Hellinger, a well-known producer, invited Lancaster to star in The Killers in 1946. Directed by Robert C. Ogmack, this picture was a huge commercial and critical success. Lancaster's performance alongside Ava Gardner propelled him into the spotlight and cemented his status as a prominent actor in Hollywood. The Killers has now become a cinematic classic, reinforcing Lancaster's reputation as an industry powerhouse. Hellinger continued to work with Lancaster, putting him in Richard Brooke's dramatic prison drama Brute Force in 1947, directed by Jules Dassin. The picture gained considerable acclaim, cementing Lancaster's reputation as a versatile and talented performer. Lancaster's second collaboration with Wallace was I Walk Alone in 1947, a thrilling noir starring Elizabeth Scott and a teenage Kirk Douglas, who were also under contract with Wallace. The picture was a box office hit, grossing more than $2 million and reinforcing Lancaster's star status. Lancaster took on a different task in 1948 when Universal Pictures made a film adaptation of Arthur Miller's play All My Sons, co-starring Edward G. Robinson. His flexibility was once again on display in Sorry Wrong Number, another Wallace production in which he co-starred with Barbara Stanwyck. Throughout his early Hollywood career, Lancaster's relationship with Hal Wallace was crucial in determining his trajectory as an actor, demonstrating his versatility and aptitude across all genres and characters. The Norma Productions and its collaborations Later on, Burt Lancaster and Harold formed Norma Productions. Their relationship began in 1948 with a pact with Universal Pictures to develop the gripping thriller Kiss the Blood Off My Hands. Set in London and starring Joan Fontaine, the picture, directed by Norman Foster, did not make a lot of money, but received critical acclaim for its gripping story. In 1949, Lancaster rejoined filmmaker Robert Siodmak for Criss Cross in Hollywood. Originally scheduled for production under Mark Hellinger, the project underwent a change after Hellinger's death, but Lancaster remained committed to the film. Notably, this film featured an early appearance by Tony Curtis, adding to its historical relevance. Lancaster maintained his relationship with Hal Wallace, playing in his fourth Wallace-produced film, Rope of Sand, which was released in 1949. Despite Lancaster's growing relationship with Norma Productions, his devotion to Wallace remained undeniable. Norma Productions then secured a partnership with Warner Brothers, which resulted in three pictures. The Flame and the Arrow demonstrated Lancaster's versatility in a swashbuckling adventure, using his circus skills to enchant spectators. The film, which included Lancaster's close friend Nick Cravat in a supporting role, not only grossed an astounding $6 million at the box office, but it also changed Lancaster's image in Hollywood, establishing him as a leading man with broad appeal. Lancaster also ventured outside of Warner Brothers. He was loaned to 20th Century Fox for the comic film Mr. 880, alongside Edmund Gwen. Lancaster's charisma and comedic timing bolstered his reputation as a versatile actor capable of performing in a variety of genres. Lancaster made his mark in the Western genre in 1951 with MGM's Vengeance Valley, demonstrating his acting versatility. His return to Warner Brothers for Jim Thorpe, All-American in the same year, demonstrated his devotion to creating riveting performances in a variety of roles. Expanding their horizons, Norma Productions signed an agreement with Columbia Pictures to make two films through their subsidiary, Halbert. In Ten Tall Men, Lancaster played a member of the French Foreign Legion, with Robert Aldrich serving as production manager. Their third film, The First Time, marked Lancaster's first absence from the screen in one of their productions. Nonetheless, their fruitful collaboration shaped the landscape of Hollywood, leaving an enduring stamp on its history. Norma Production Becomes Hecht Lancaster Productions the Norma production was renamed to Hecht Lancaster Productions in 1951, marking a key milestone in their movie careers. This move reflected their mutual desire to make exciting and diverse films that would fascinate audiences all across the world. Under this new name, 
they began a series of ambitious undertakings that would define the Hollywood scene for years to come. In 1952, they released The Crimson Pirate under the Hecht Lancaster Productions brand. This swashbuckling tale, directed by Robert Siodmak and featuring Lancaster and his close buddy Nick Cravat, transported moviegoers on an exciting journey replete with high seas action and daring escapades. The picture was a huge hit gaining universal praise and cementing Lancaster's status as a charismatic leading man. Following the success of The Crimson Pirate, Lancaster decided to venture into new terrain with Come Back Little Sheba in 1952. Based on a renowned Broadway play, the picture was a break from Lancaster's customary action-packed performances, demonstrating his dramatic versatility in a devastating and emotionally compelling performance. Starring Shirley Booth, and produced by industry heavyweight Hal Wallace, Come Back Little Sheba, received critical acclaim and cemented Lancaster's reputation as a versatile performer capable of producing powerful performances across genres. Despite their efforts in a dramatic narrative, Lancaster and Hecht pursued their penchant for adventure with South Sea Woman in 1952. The South Sea Woman provided the ideal opportunity to explore exotic settings and have fascinating adventures. Arthur Lubin directed the film, which highlighted Lancaster's rough charm and captivating screen presence, cementing his place as a leading man in Hollywood. In 1954, Lancaster produced and starred in His Majesty O'Keefe, a gripping story set in the lush settings of the South Sea Islands. The picture, co-written by James Hill, who would later become an important component of the Hecht Lancaster collaboration, highlighted Lancaster's business energy and commitment to telling great tales on film. His Majesty O'Keefe was shot on location in Fiji and captures the beauty and intrigue of the South Pacific, enthralling audiences with its exotic setting and exhilarating adventure. Hecht Lancaster Productions' collaboration with United Artists. Moving to United Artists, Hecht and Lancaster began a new chapter in their movie careers. Their association with the studio began with Apache in 1954, a thrilling Western drama that demonstrated Lancaster's acting flexibility. Robert Aldrich directed the film, which addressed themes of honor, treachery, and redemption against the backdrop of the American frontier. Lancaster provided a standout performance as the conflicted Apache warrior, gaining critical acclaim and cementing his place as a Western genre icon. Following the success of Apache, Hecht Lancaster Productions collaborated with United Artists again on Vera Cruz the same year. The film, starring Lancaster and screen legend Gary Cooper and produced by James Hill, was a high-octane Western adventure that captivated viewers all over the world. Vera Cruz, directed by Robert Aldrich, was a box office success, solidifying Lancaster's reputation as a bankable star and establishing Hecht Lancaster Productions as a powerful force in Hollywood. Their collaboration with United Artists blossomed resulting in a multi-picture deal that produced several critically praised pictures. One of their most memorable collaborations was Marty in 1955, a moving drama directed by Delbert Mann and starring Ernest Borgnine. The picture received tremendous acclaim, winning several accolades, including the Oscar for Best Picture and the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Picture Festival. Marty established Hecht Lancaster Productions as one of Hollywood's most successful independent production firms, laying the path for future collaborations and solidifying Lancaster's position as a formidable producer and actor. With its bold vision and unflinching dedication, Hecht Lancaster Productions altered the Hollywood scene, creating a legacy of timeless classics and outstanding performances. The rebranding of the production firm to Hecht Hill Lancaster. In 1955, the landscape of Hollywood changed dramatically when James Hill was awarded an equal partnership with Harold Hecht and Burt Lancaster, culminating in the rebranding of their production firm to Hecht Hill Lancaster. This key moment signaled the start of a new age in cinema, defined by collaboration, innovation, and unprecedented success. In 1956, the trio started on their first major movie venture under the umbrella of Hecht Hill Lancaster, Trapeze. This spectacular film, starring Lancaster, Tony Curtis, and Gina Lollabrigida, showed Lancaster's daring stunts and enthralled audiences with its exciting story. Trapeze became a box office sensation, cementing Hecht Hill Lancaster's status as a strong production firm and laying the path for future projects. Lancaster, Hecht, and Hill expanded their creative boundaries by entering the music industry in 1956, 
where they established song publishing organizations and record labels. This deliberate diversification exemplified their entrepreneurial energy and insight. Establishing Hecht Hill Lancaster as a diversified entertainment powerhouse with a pulse on popular culture, Hecht Hill Lancaster's achievement did not go unnoticed, drawing attention and appreciation from both industry insiders and audiences. With each successive project, the trio wowed Hollywood with their inventive storyline and imaginative approach to filmmaking. As Life magazine highlighted in 1957, Hecht Hill Lancaster has yet to make a commercial blunder demonstrating its unrivaled track record and persistent devotion to excellence. Despite their growing popularity, Lancaster remained committed to meeting his contractual responsibilities with Hal Wallace, releasing two great pictures under Wallace's label. The Rainmaker, starring Lancaster and Katharine Hepburn, won Lancaster a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actor, while Gunfight at the OK Corral became a commercial success, cementing Lancaster's standing as a leading actor in Hollywood. In 1957, Lancaster reunited with Tony Curtis for Sweet Smell of Success, a critically lauded picture that demonstrated Lancaster's versatility as an actor and producer. Though initially disappointed at the box office, Sweet Smell of Success has now been hailed as one of Lancaster's finest works, with praise for its sharp satire on power and morality. Throughout the late 1950s, Hecht Hill Lancaster continued to produce a broad slate of pictures, with Lancaster appearing in numerous major productions. Lancaster and Clark Gable starred in Robert Wise's compelling military drama Run Silent, Run Deep, while Separate Tables received critical praise and many Academy Award nominations. However, not all of their initiatives were successful, as The Devil's Disciple experienced financial losses and production issues. Hecht Hill Lancaster expanded its repertoire by producing the television series Whiplash, confirming its image as an entertainment industry innovator. However, internal disagreements eventually led to the company's disintegration in 1960, marking the end of an era in Hollywood. Despite the breakup, Hecht Hill Lancaster Productions' legacy lives on, making an unmistakable influence on film history. Hecht and Lancaster on and off collaborations. The production had broken up, but the career of Lancaster kept moving forward. In Richard Brooks's 1960 film Elmer Gantry, Burt Lancaster gave a brilliant performance. His performance as the title character earned him the Academy Award for Best Actor, a Golden Globe, and praise from the New York film critics. The picture itself got five Oscar nominations, cementing Lancaster's status as a leading performer. Lancaster and Harold Hecht teamed together once more for The Young Savages, a film directed by John Frankenheimer. Hecht's production prowess and Lancaster's acting prowess shined through in this absorbing drama, which also featured Sidney Pollock as a dialect coach. After moving away from Hecht, Lancaster starred in Stanley Kramer's Judgment at Nuremberg, which had an ensemble cast starring Spencer Tracy and Richard Widmark. The picture gained tremendous critical acclaim and 11 Academy Award nominations. Their collaboration resumed with the film Birdman of Alcatraz, directed by John Frankenheimer. In this biography, Lancaster played Robert Stroud, a federal prisoner with a penchant for birds. Lancaster's moving performance got him accolades for Best Actor at the Oscars, BAFTAs, and Golden Globes. While Hecht experimented with independent filmmaking, Lancaster's influence was undeniable. Hecht later pursued a solo career. Highest solo achievements included producing Cat Baloo, which went on to win an Academy Award and demonstrated Hecht's persistent brilliance as a producer. Despite pursuing separate projects, Hecht and Lancaster's on and off collaborations had a lasting impact on the cinema business. Other collaborations with younger filmmakers. Collaborations with younger filmmakers highlighted Burt Lancaster's versatility and openness to emerging talent. In 1963, he co-starred with Judy Garland in the emotional drama A Child is Waiting, produced by Stanley Kramer and directed by John Cassavetes. Lancaster's performance demonstrated his ability to handle complicated roles among veteran actors. Lancaster traveled to Italy to work with director Lucino Visconti on the film The Leopard, which also starred Alain Delon and Claudia Cardinale. While the picture was a success in France, it failed to make an effect in the United States, demonstrating Lancaster's desire to explore international cinema. In the list of Adrian Messenger, Lancaster had a supporting part for Kirk Douglas, who also produced and starred. 
Lancaster continued his work with filmmaker John Frankenheimer, appearing in Seven Days in May and The Train, demonstrating his flexibility in both the political thriller and action genres. Lancaster's comedy talents emerged in John Sturgis's western The Hallelujah Trail. Despite the film's box office troubles, Lancaster's captivating performance was a standout. However, one of Lancaster's most significant triumphs during this period was The Professionals, a western directed by Richard Brooks and co-starring Lee Marvin. Lancaster's star power boosted the film's commercial and critical success. Lancaster appeared naked in Frank Perry's film The Swimmer. Overcoming personal hurdles, including a phobia of water, Lancaster delivered a stunning performance that received critical acclaim, with Roger Ebert calling it as one of his best. Despite the film's commercial failure, Lancaster's dedication to his craft and willingness to push creative limits remain unwavering, demonstrating his determination to give engaging performances regardless of the dangers involved. The Formation of Norland Productions In 1967, Burt Lancaster and Roland Kibbe formed Norland Productions. In 1968, they worked together to make The Scalp Hunters, which was directed by Sidney Pollock. Lancaster followed with the flop Castle Keep in 1969, again directed by Pollock. Frankenheimer's 1969 film The Gypsy Moths proved to be another flop. Burt Lancaster reached the pinnacle of his career in 1970 with the picture Airport, which starred Dean Martin, George Kennedy, and Jacqueline Bissett. The film, directed by Ross Hunter, received widespread acclaim and was nominated for nine Academy Awards, including Best Picture. It debuted as a blockbuster, becoming Universal Pictures' highest-grossing film of the time and confirming Lancaster's standing as a major actor of his time. Following his popularity, Lancaster starred in a number of Western films, including Lawman, Valdez is Coming, and Ulzana's Raid. Although both films did not acquire the same level of fame as Airport, Ulzana's Raid developed a cult following, demonstrating Lancaster's versatility as an actor. Lancaster experimented with the thriller genre in 1973, releasing two pictures, Scorpio and Executive Action, demonstrating his versatility across cinematic disciplines. However, he did not restrict himself to acting alone. Lancaster took the director's chair in 1974 for The Midnight Man, a picture he also wrote and produced, showcasing his multifarious abilities behind the camera. Lancaster continued to collaborate with prominent directors, reuniting with director Lucino Visconti for a conversation piece in 1974, demonstrating his ability to adapt to different artistic conceptions. He also played the title character in the TV series Moses the Lawgiver, demonstrating his versatility and depth as an actor beyond the screen. Lancaster continued to work in film and television throughout the late 1970s, appearing in a variety of productions, including Bernardo Bertolucci's 1900 and Robert Altman's Buffalo Bill and the Indians. His willingness to play secondary roles, such as Shimon Peres in Victory at Entebbe, demonstrated his preference for storyline over character importance. In 1978, Lancaster played the lead in Go Tell the Spartans, a Vietnam War picture that spoke to him strongly. Despite the lower price he took for the project, Lancaster's commitment to the script demonstrated his enthusiasm for meaningful storytelling. Furthermore, his appearance in Zulu Dawn demonstrated his readiness to connect with multiple tales from various historical contexts. As the 1980s began, Lancaster continued to enchant audiences with his performances, most notably in Louis Malle's Atlantic City, in which he co-starred with Susan Sarandon. The picture received tremendous critical acclaim, earning Lancaster an Oscar nomination for Best Actor and cementing his image as a versatile actor capable of delivering nuanced performances. Throughout the early 1980s, Lancaster's career transitioned toward character-driven roles in film and TV. Despite this transformation, he continued to provide notable performances in films such as The Osterman Weekend and the television drama Scandal Sheet, demonstrating his enduring screen presence and flexibility. Lancaster's international popularity was clear in the second half of the decade when he appeared in films such as Fathers and Sons, a German tragedy for German television and control for Italian audiences. His partnership with Kirk Douglas in Tough Guys provided a sentimental reunion for fans of the famed couple, solidifying their position in cinematic history. 
Among his prodigious productions, Lancaster's portrayal as Moonlight Graham in Field of Dreams stood out as a heartbreaking reminder of his ability to give even minor roles depth and meaning. His role in the miniseries The Betrothed demonstrated his continued relevance in the television scene. Lancaster's later career included powerful performances in TV dramas, including The Phantom of the Opera and Voyage of Terror, The Achille Lauro Affair. His cooperation with Sidney Poitier in Separate But Equal was a fitting end to a great career that spanned decades. Douglas and Lancaster, the best collaboration in Lancaster's career. Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster appeared together in seven films spanning decades, from 1948, I Walk Alone, to 1986, Tough Guys. Despite Douglas's regular billing below Lancaster's, they developed a memorable team with roles of comparable magnitude. Both performers entered Hollywood at the same time and progressed to become actor-producers, paving the way for their independent careers. John Frankenheimer directed five films starring Lancaster, including Birdman of Alcatraz and Seven Days in May. Their collaboration demonstrated a fruitful working relationship that yielded acclaimed film achievements. Lancaster's career was highlighted by numerous collaborations with renowned directors like Robert Aldrich, Robert Sodmak, and Sidney Pollack, among others. Notably, he worked with Aldrich four times, demonstrating a good working relationship. Furthermore, Lancaster's frequent collaborations included makeup artist Robert Schiffer, who worked with him on nearly all of his acknowledged films. Roland Kibbe also wrote for seven Lancaster films, demonstrating the actor's predilection for collaborating with a trusted crew. These collaborative endeavors highlight Lancaster's dedication to cultivating long-term professional ties within the filmmaking business, which contributed greatly to his lasting influence on cinema, marriages, relationships, and affairs. Despite his renowned stature in Hollywood, Burt Lancaster was extremely protective of his personal life, attempting to keep it out of the public eye. Throughout his life, he married three times, had several affairs, and struggled with his religious convictions. Lancaster's first marriage was to June Ernst, a trapeze artist with whom he performed until their split in the late 1930s. The actual year of their divorce is unknown. His second marriage was to Norma Anderson, whom he met when she filled in for an unwell actress in a USO performance. Their whirlwind passion culminated in marriage in 1946, and they handled married life's complications while raising five children. Despite their shared devotion to political causes, such as civil rights advocacy, their relationship was fraught with conflict, ending in their separation in 1966 and later divorce in 1969. Following his breakup with Norma, Lancaster had a turbulent relationship with Jackie Bone, a hairdresser he met while filming The Professionals. Their relationship was volatile, with frequent heated confrontations and physical altercations. However, their relationship eventually deteriorated due to irreconcilable differences, notably following Bone's religious conversion, which Lancaster found difficult to accept. In a twist of fate, Lancaster found love again when he married Susan Martin in September 1990. Their relationship lasted until Lancaster's death, which marked the end of his romantic journey. Despite his vows to marry, Lancaster's personal life was marred by reports of adulterous encounters with various Hollywood actresses. Speculation persisted that he had a romantic relationship with Deborah Kerr while filming From Here to Eternity in 1953, but Kerr fiercely denied any physical contact between them. Lancaster was also alleged to have had affairs with Joan Blondell and Shelley Winters, with the latter claiming a passionate two-year affair. Away from problems of the heart, Lancaster's spiritual ideas have evolved significantly throughout time. Despite being reared in a Protestant household, he later became an atheist, breaking away from his upbringing's religious traditions. Despite his efforts to retain his solitude, his relationships and spiritual journey provide insight into the intricacies of the man behind the iconic Hollywood persona, health issues, and death. Behind the glitz and glamour, Burt was suffering from many health issues. Burt Lancaster struggled with cardiovascular illness in his senior years. In January 1980, as he approached his 60th birthday, he underwent a regular gallbladder surgery, which resulted in complications that almost killed him. Despite having survived the ordeal, Lancaster's health remained unstable. By 1983, Lancaster had suffered two small heart attacks, leading surgeons to conduct an emergency quadruple coronary bypass operation. Despite these health setbacks, Lancaster persevered, pursuing his acting career and engaged in civic advocacy. 
Lancaster banded together with former colleagues James Stewart and Ginger Rogers in 1988 to resist media magnate Ted Turner's controversial plan to colorize historic black and white pictures from Hollywood's golden age. Lancaster's dedication to maintaining the integrity of film history demonstrated his genuine love for the medium. Lancaster died after a disabling stroke in November 1990 when he was 77. The stroke left him partially paralyzed and unable to speak, effectively ruining his successful acting career. Lancaster died of a third heart attack on October 20, 1994, in his Century City Los Angeles apartment. His death signaled the end of an era in Hollywood, as he was one of the few remaining icons from the golden age of cinema. Lancaster's body was cremated in accordance with his desires, and his ashes were strewn beneath a great oak tree in Westwood Memorial Park, a peaceful final resting place. A simple plaque with the inscription, Burt Lancaster 1913-1994, stands as a humble memorial to his lasting legacy. In May 2013, the Film Society of Lincoln Center in New York City commemorated Lancaster's centennial birthday by presenting 12 of his most celebrated films, recognizing his extraordinary contributions to filmmaking. Lancaster is also honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, a fitting homage to his lasting impact on the entertainment business. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more exciting content.